Thanks. You can be seated. Ryan, let me have that now. I know it was bothering you being up there. I actually need it up here. All right. Thank you. It bothered Ryan that that was sitting there and uh, he was going to put it back in the back room like, no, 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 no. I need it. I need it. Leave it there. Um, all right. Here we go. Now you're wondering what's going on. Just a typical Sunday message in here. Uh, we're in the book of First Peter. All right. So uh, Peter is writing to a bunch of Christians that are scattered around. Uh, they are hearing of the persecution of Christians in Rome. There are Christians that are being executed in Rome because Nero is in charge and he hates Christians. And so Nero's executing. They're wondering when they're going to be next. And so Peter writes this book trying to encourage these people and helping them in the difficulty and persecution and maybe even possible death that is about to come. So we've been walking our way through 1 Peter. We've talked about chapter 1 in which Peter talks about the idea that um, really the key verse we're going to get to in a couple of weeks, but it's right here. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And Peter writes this book reminding these people of these principles. And so we've talked about them that oh, we've talked about. I don't, I don't want to get there first. How, why did I do that? OK, no, no, let me do. OK, there we go. Um, I, don't worry, it'll come back. Uh, I forgot to put my blank slide in there. So he writes to these people and in chapter one, he's talked about the idea that you are a chosen people, that your salvation is a great big deal. He talks to them about this concept that you are God's special inheritance. God actually looks at you as something that he has inherited that has incredible value. Last week, we talked about the idea that in a positive way, one of the things that these people need to do is they need to learn to love each other fervently uh, and sincerely. And we're going to kind of jump off of that this morning because now he's going to talk as he gets to chapter two. He's going to talk about it in terms of negative things. And he's going to say, if you're genuinely going to love each other sincerely and fervently, there are some things that you have to do. And so I'm going to read the whole passage, all three verses. And in the original language, this was one sentence. OK, so we see it as three separate ideas. This was one big sentence uh, in the verses one through three. And here's it. Therefore, in other words, we talked about incorruptible seed. We've talked about the idea that you need to love fervently and, and sincerely. Therefore. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, Hi hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, like newborn babes, crave. The key verb in the whole sentence is that word crave. Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So let's walk through all the words, all the, all the phrases, and then we're going to apply it. All right. So he starts with this. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So one of the things that we have to understand is where he starts off and he says, therefore, in other words, if you're really going to love people fervently, you're going to love your brothers fervently, you're going to love them sincerely, here's what you need to do. You're a special possession. You are a special inheritance. You are a chosen people. Now, here's what you have to do because of all that I've said in chapter one. Rid yourselves. This is an interesting word. Um, basically, um, it has to do with this idea of old clothes. The idea is that, and, and some of you can relate to this, you've been out, you've been working, you're hot, you're sweaty, you come on, you come in the house and you take off those clothes and you put on another set of clothes. Rid yourselves. In my, ha in my house, here's what happens to, a, I buy a new shirt, buy a new t-shirt, usually it's a Harley t-shirt, buy a Harley t-shirt. Uh, and uh, I wear it 
and then it starts to get stains on it. Uh, and then it starts to get old and ratty and it goes into a special bag in my house that goes out to my shed. It has now become a shop rag. Okay? I now use it for changing oil. I use it for wiping grease off my hands. I use it for all kinds of things. So this morning, I grabbed, as I got ready to leave my shed this morning, I grabbed my current pile of shop rags that I used this week. <laughs> You're like, you used all those this week? Yeah. Don't even ask. Um, no, I changed oil and stuff like that. So, and some of you are going, well, that's a good rag. I'd be wearing that puppy if it was me. But no, okay, I understand. But these are the, these are the, the shop rags. I didn't, I'm not going to put, in fact, this morning, here's what happened. I actually, and this is a whole other application of this thing. I grabbed these out of my shop. I'm dressed like this. I got in the church parking lot and I had to bring all this stuff in. I got my, I got my, my, my briefcase thing. I got my coffee. I got all of this stuff and I've got these things. And I put them up again. I didn't have my coat on. And I put them up again. I, thought, oh, I could ruin my good clothes with my shop rag. That's a whole nother application <laughs> of what happens when you allow malice and slander and deceit and these things in your life. But we're not going to go there. So anyway, here's the idea. Here's what he said. You know what you do with this? You know what you do with these in your life? You rid yourselves of them. That's, uh, I'm going to take these out and keep using them, but um, <laughs> I still, these got a good couple of months still on them. But that's it. He says, rid yourselves of them. Get rid of it. It has no value to you. Just like when you take off your old clothes that you, at the end of a day, you take them off because you don't want to continue to be in those. You want to put on something new. And that's exactly what he says. Rid yourselves of these five things. And he starts this list. He starts with the idea of malice. Malice is a word that we don't use a lot. Uh, but here's what malice is. Malice is the desire to hurt or inflict pain or injury. In other words, malice is like revenge on steroids. It's not enough that I got even. I want to get even and hurt you. I want to get even. I, I don't want just want revenge. I want malice. I want you to hurt. I want to inflict pain on you. With my words, with my actions, with the way that I'm treating you. I want, to cause, I, I, am, I want to cause malice. Some people look at it as bitterness. Um, some people look at it um, as this uh, way to make you miserable. He says, you know what you need to do with that attitude in your life? Get rid of it. It has no place in somebody who's going to love fervently and sincerely. Then he goes on to the next word, all deceit. Um, this is the idea, uh, some, some versions say guile uh, is the way some versions translate it. Actually, the word is a word that some of you are going to be familiar with. It's a fish hook idea. When you go fishing, what do you do? You don't just take the hook and throw it out there. No, no, no. You put something on it that looks enticing to a fish. You hide it so that the fish doesn't see the hook. That's deceit. That's guile. That's the idea of, I want to trick you. I want to let you, I want to get something from you, and I'm going to get that from you by manipulating you. That's the idea. And Peter says, look, if you're really going to love people, you've got to get rid of that. You can't have that mindset in your life. It's actually a word that has, um, it's a business word. It's actually the idea of when you do your taxes, you're not telling them everything. You're deceiving them. That's deceit. That's guile. Peter says, get rid of all of it. In your life. Um, fishermen do this a lot. That's why I think it's a great fishing term. How big was it? 
In fact, I learned this. I learned this from people in this church. When you take a picture of a fish that you caught, do you know what you do? You grab it and you hold it out in front of you. It always looks bigger than if you held it beside you. People in this church taught me this. You know, I forget who it was. As somebody, and we're taking a picture. And, and they're like, oh, no, hold it out in front. It's going to look bigger. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, yeah, here we go. That's what he said. That's deceit. That's deceit. You don't hold it up. You don't hold it up with a ruler and go, see, it's exactly. No, 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 no. You make it look bigger than it is. So no, I know, I know you guys, fishermen are getting nervous. Don't worry. Just stop doing it. Okay. In fact, Christian fishermen will now hold it beside a ruler. So that's the way you do it. But I mean, this is the idea. It's deceit, by the way. This is what couples start doing with each other in their marriages. And they start hiding things from each other. Oh, oh, I don't want her to see. You know, I like what some of these stores say. You know, um, it'll cost you five dollars more and we'll give you a receipt that matches what you're going to tell your spouse. (laughs) You know, I mean, come on, that's really where we are. It's like, I don't want her to know how much I spent. I don't want him to know how much I spent. Um, it's deceit. Now, get rid of it. It has no place in the life of a believer. And it goes on. Hypocrisy. This is actually a theater term. Putting on a mask. I don't want you to see the real me. So I'm going to let you see a different version of me. I'm going to walk in on Sunday and it's going to be the church version. And as soon as I get home, I'm going to take off my mask and I'm going to put on my, my version of me. Doesn't have a place in the life of a believer. Hypoc- um, envy. Um, envy actually is plural. It's an interesting word. Um, envy has the idea of um, I am jealous of their goodness. Um, but it takes it one step further than jealousy. Uh, In fact, one guy said this, one writer said, it's the greatest of all diseases among men is envy. Envy, we don't talk about envy a lot. You know what envy is? By the way, we have a culture that this is one of our main problems. You know what envy says? Envy, Envy is different than jealousy. Jealousy says, I want what you have. Envy says, you shouldn't have what you have, I should have it. By the way, are you not watching that happen within our culture? I want to get into politics thing, but is that not what political is? I don't think those people should have that, they should give it to me. That's envy. That's envy. That's what the writer here is talking about. In fact, do you know that envy is the reason Jesus went to the cross? Mark says the chief priests put him to death because they were envious of him. They saw people following him and they thought those people should be following them. That's why they put him to cross. This, in fact, uh, Proverbs lists this as one of the seven deadly sins. We don't talk about this anymore. But this thing will kill you spiritually. This idea of, I can't believe they have it, I should have it. This will will ruin you emotionally if you're not careful. Somebody pulls in here with a brand new truck, and it's all tricked out. You know what I think? God bless you. I'm so happy for you. Because I don't ever have to buy the tires for it. You know, honestly, I drive around and see these guys with the big dualies on the back, and I'm thinking, oh, poor you. You know, um, I understand, you know, why do they have to, I understand all, but here's the idea. The idea is, envy says, you shouldn't have it, I should. Get rid of it. You can't love somebody sincerely and fervently with that mindset. And then he talks about slander. Um, Slander is basically shooting people with words. Um, it's an attempt to make yourself cleaner by throwing mud at somebody else. 
Slander is this idea of, King James says, evil speaking. Be very careful what you say about anybody else. It doesn't belong in the life of a believer. John Piper, in summing these, summarizing these things, says this. Malice is the desire to hurt someone with words or deeds. Guile is the desire to gain an advantage or, pres or, or preserve some p passion or position by deception. Hypocrisy is, I don't want you to know what I really am. Envy is a desire for some privilege or benefit that belongs to another with resentment that another person has it and you don't. And then slander is the desire for revenge and self-enhancement. The worse light we can put another person in by slander, the less our own darkness shows. You be very, very careful about what you say about somebody else. I have watched this play out over and over and over again in 40 years of ministry. When people get a, a ticked at somebody, whether you're talking about um, a business thing that went south, whether you're talking about a marriage that went south, whether you're talking about somebody in the community said something or hurt you, or some judge did, gave this rating with your kid, or whatever it was, and they started doing this stuff. And it poisons them. And it starts poisoning their relationship. And Peter writes to these people and he says, this stuff needs to go here. Get rid of it. Then he goes on. And listen to what he says. Like newborn babes crave spiritual milk. Pure spiritual milk, so that they may grow up in your salvation. Um, again, he packs this thing full. He starts with newborn babes. Literally, the idea is a baby who is nursing. I have been around babies enough to know this. When there is a newborn baby, you know what they want? Milk. You would be amazed at what they tried to bite because they want milk. Why? That's what, that's what Peter's saying. In fact, it's interesting because many of the fertility gods of this time were associated with this milk concept. And some people don't even think he's alluding to that idea that the, of the gods taking care of you and nourishing you. He says, no, like newborn babies. And then he uses this idea of crave. The absolute, the idea of crave is you long for it. It's actually the key verb in, verb in this whole sentence. He says you, you crave it. Have you ever craved something? Opa time opened three or four weeks ago. Saw that, saw you. <sighs> Never so happy. You know, I'm sitting in Hot Springs, Arkansas with my wife, having a great time. And I'm thinking, I cannot wait till we get back and I can go to Opa time. I got there the following week. I sat there. If you don't know, they had a fire. It's my favorite restaurant in all of Sioux City. And they built it back. And the, everything's the same. I mean, not everything. But, I mean, they built new stuff. But everything is the same. It was the same food on the same kind of tray in the same. It was more expensive. But I didn't care. <laughs> I love that place. I love that food. It's my favorite food. Only thing I crave more than that is White Castle. And the closest restaurant is, I got to go Minneapolis or Chicago. Um, I have driven, actually, for a White Castle, I actually drove an hour and a half one time. That's how, that's how much I love these things, okay? If you've never had one, you are... <laughs> they sell them in the store, it's just not the same. If you've never had one, I'm telling you right now, you have lived a deprived life. Um, but anyway... I, Crave them. In fact, by the way, their slogan is crave. I mean, it is their, their slogan. See, it's biblical. They're, you need to eat. It's biblical food. Anyway, notice what he says. Crave pure. Um, this is unadulterated. Uh, literally, the, the, the idea here is in this culture, two things they often diluted were milk and wine. They would add water to it. 
So it wasn't pure. That's the idea here. He says you need to crave pure spiritual milk. Now, I'm not a great healthy eater by any means. But one thing I do eat that is healthy for me is bananas. I have a banana every day. I, I, I just love bananas. I have a banana every morning for breakfast. It's one of the things that I eat, okay? So let me show you this banana. Um, this actually exists. This is a deep fried banana covered in honey and chocolate drizzle. Now, let's understand the concept behind the people who came up with this. Okay? They take something that is healthy, a banana, incredible amount of nutritional value. They deep fry it. That offsets now all of the nutritional value of the banana. Then they add honey to it. Honey's good for you. So now they have added to the nutritional value of a deep fried banana. And then they cover it in chocolate drizzle. And they undo the healthy benefit of the honey. So in other words, this is horrible for you. Now, it tastes great, I'm sure. I love all of those things. Banana, fried foods, drizz, uh, honey, and chocolate. I mean, I, I, I can eat any one of those things by themselves. So to me, you put this together, it's like the epitome of something that should be awesome. But it has zero nutritional value for it. You want to know what happens for most of us? We're living off of this kind of stuff. So when we talk about craving the spiritual food of God, just it doesn't compare for us. And what Peter says to these people is, you need to crave the pure spiritual milk. And that word spiritual is another fascinating word. It's only used one other time in the scripture. Romans chapter 12, where it says, where... Um, um, present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service. That's the other time that it's used. And Peter says, you need to understand. And, and, and the word actually has a root in the word logos, which is connected to John chapter one, which is connected to this whole idea of the living word and, and God and all this. What Peter is saying to these people is you need to crave that. You need to make the word of God important that way. And he says, and he gives you the purpose. The purpose is so you can grow up spiritually. And then Peter does something that I wish I could spend the whole service unpacking. But listen to what he says next. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Um. I don't have time to unpack anything. I'm going to make a really feeble attempt at it. Because there's a lot of Greek stuff going on here that you don't see. Okay? So let me try to give you a little bit of... I'm, I'm going to butcher it and everything else, but it'll give you an idea. The word for Lord is kurios. Normally, we would say the Lord Jesus Christ, Right? People reading this, that's what they would have thought. When he said Lord, they would have thought Lord Jesus Christ. Kurios, Jesus, Christos, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody follow me so far? Kurios, Jesus, Christos. You know what the word for good is? Christos. It's a play on words. You know what Peter is saying to them? When you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, kurios, Jesus, Christos, the Lord, kurios, is Christos. In some cases, they actually almost pronounce the words the same. And what Peter is saying to them is, I always want you to associate the Lord with goodness. He's not just your Christ, he is good. Instead of saying, kurios, Christos, kurios, Christos. That's what he's saying to these people. And he's trying to pack this idea full. You, this word is fascinating if you study it all out. 
When Jesus says, come unto me, all you labor, all the, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, take my yoke, uh, or take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is Christos. Easy. That's what he's saying. When he, Jesus comes to him and says, no, no man, when Jesus is telling the parable, he says, no man says that the old wine is Christos enough. It is so good. It is great. That's what Peter's saying. Your God's great. In fact, Romans chapter 2 says, the goodness of God leads to repentance. The Christos of God leads to repentance. God is good. Now listen, you know who he's saying this to? People who are going to be falsely accused, who are going to be imprisoned, who are going to be contemplating their death, a gruesome death, very soon. And he's writing to these people and saying, never forget. Your Lord, Kurios, Jesus, Christos, is Christos. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Why? Because they may go to their death wondering, if they're not careful, whether or not God is good. So, that's the passage. That's the one verse Peter writes. Let's talk about us, first thing. You have to understand, from last week and this week, the horizontal relationship that you have with people directly connects to your horizontal, your, your vertical relationship with God. They are connected. Um, in fact, John actually says it this way, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen can't love God whom he hasn't seen. John says, you want to be able to hang on to all of this stuff when it comes to your brother in Christ and show malice and envy and slander and that kind of thing and then talk about how much you love your God? You know what he says? You're a liar. You can't do that as a Christian. If you're a Christian, you know where this goes? It all goes there. Oh, man. It all goes there. That's where it goes. In fact, here's how Peter would say, not only does it go there, it goes there. You get it as far away from your life as you can. It doesn't have a place in the life of a believer. And some of us have got to start being honest with ourselves. And we think we have a right to think this way or act this way towards somebody else. Not if we're going to call ourselves Christians. That's what Peter says. You get rid of it. Second idea. You have to learn to desire God's word. I mean really desire. Now look, there's a lot of reasons we don't read our Bible. There's a lot of reasons we don't study our Bible. There's a lot of reasons. Some of it may be very practical. You've been brought up to believe that you can only read a certain version. Then go find a version that you can understand. We give Bibles to people all the time here. And I sit down and say, tell me what, tell me what you're comfortable with. Tell me what your needs are. And then we find a Bible for them geared to help it so they can understand it. Some of it's just a simple thing about getting the right version. Some of it, some of you are not readers. Then you know what? You are fortunate that you live in a culture in which you can listen to the word of God. And there are people who actually will read it for you in a, in a version. You know, I have, I have the Bible app on my phone. I can have the Bible read to me while I'm driving down the road. There are so many opportunities for us. For some of you, it may be because you're not a Christian. You don't know the author. For some of you, the reality of it is it may be because there's sin in your life. And so, you know, you, can, you have no desire to read it. You're pursuing other things. But you know what it is for most of us? Deep fried bananas. We have so filled our lives with the junk food that this world has to offer. 
that when it actually comes time to reading God's word, we're exhausted. We don't have time. We've done this and that and this and that and this and that and this and that. And, and, and we have just filled our lives. I'm convinced one of Satan's greatest tools to destroy your family right now, busyness. He will keep your family so busy, you don't get to spend time as a family. Oh, no, you don't understand. We do all kinds of things together. Really? Or are you rather the taxi service dropping your kid off or sitting in the stands while your kid does something or your grandkid does something so that you can then turn around and say that's family time? You haven't talked to them. You haven't spent time with them. You haven't done anything with them. All you've done is become a spectator to their world. And Satan has convinced you that's family time. Honest or not? I mean, that's what happens. We have substituted reality, real family, for junk food family. We have substituted real time with the spirit, pure spiritual milk of the word of God with, I'm so busy. And that's what Paul, Peter says. He says, look, you've got to get back to wanting that pure, spiritual, unadulterated kind of stuff from the Word of God. I'm thrilled that you're here. But listening to me is not enough. I'm thrilled that I get the opportunity to help feed you and teach you and, and let you learn some things. But you've got to do it on your own, too. What happens to a kid who grows up and they never learn to feed themselves? And they always depend on somebody else to feed them. We can't do that in our spiritual life. It's like my wife. My wife's favorite food. If I want to make my wife real, if I want, my wife knows it's a good day when I look at her and go, uh, I'm fixing dinner tonight and I want to make your favorite. She knows, here's what she's coming home to. A steak on the grill with a baked potato that has been cooked in an oven for an hour, actually an air fryer, but um, for an hour, crispy on the outside, cut it just nice and soft and tender on the inside, and then she's either gonna get broccoli or asparagus. I'm not gonna eat it, but she is. <laughs> and let's say I, tomorrow, and I'm gonna be gone, but let's say tomorrow night I looked at her, I look at her and I say, hey, by the way, tomorrow I'm gonna have, uh, when you come home, I'm gonna have steak for you. She looks forward to that all day. She gets into Claire, taking Claire home. She says, Claire, I'm really hungry right now. Let's stop it. What's that place you eat? Cadoba or Co Co yeah, Cadoba? I don't eat anything there. She gets this, got to Cadoba. She gets this great big salad. She sits down. She eats it. My wife gets off at 4 o'clock. Okay? We usually have supper at 5. We're not quite the old people that eat at 4 yet, but we're getting there. We eat at 5 because I'm usually gone by 6 or 6.30 in the evening. So we get that little time to eat. So normally supper's at 5 o'clock. 4 o'clock, Jean's in the car with Claire. She's driving by. They go to Cadoba. She gets a nice big salad. She eats it there. She gets home 5 o'clock. And I say, oh, awesome, you're home. 15 minutes, it's all going to be ready. And we, she sits down 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, I've got her steak I've got the baked potato. I've got her broccoli and asparagus and all of that stuff. And she looks at it and says, what? I'm not hungry. Is there a problem with the food? No. What's the problem? She ate junk food. Now, I know Cadoba's like salad stuff, so it's not junk food. By the time I'm done with it, it's junk food because it's got bacon bits and all the other stuff on it it's not supposed to have. Why? She's full. That's exactly what's happening with some of you. You have not set as a priority the time in God's word. And so by the time you do get to it, you're full of the junk stuff of the world. The last thing is this. Taste and see. The curios is Christos. God is good. When you go through a difficult time, you want to know one of the first things that Satan's going to do? Mark my words. He's going to get you to question the goodness of God in your life. Always. You know what he did with Adam and Eve, first thing in the garden? He questioned the goodness of God. Hath God really said, God's keeping something from you. In fact, I'll tell you what, you follow me, 
I'll show you things God's keeping from you. God is not have at your best interest goodness. He's being he's not being good to you. He's keeping stuff from you. Satan will always work to get you to question the goodness of God. These people may be facing death because they called themselves a Christian. And Peter lays out this foundation for him to understand. God is always good in your life. You need to look for the goodness of God in whatever situation you face. I guarantee you it is there. Well, you don't understand. They told me I had cancer. You don't understand. You live in a country where they can actually diagnose it. You actually got to see a doctor who can give you a course of treatment. We listened to Lori talk about her experience when they lost a child and she had to go to the hospital. The hospital, which was a boat ride away. And you know what it consisted? It's an open air building. And that was the best hospital around. I mean, we go in and they got masks and gloves and this and that. And they pull things out of things that have been sterilized. And they've done all of this stuff that's all sealed up. Well, come on. You know how good God has been to you to put you in this country? You know, we forget the Christos has been Christos to you. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. I end this morning with this idea. Peter reminds his readers a horizontal relationship is essential to a vertical relationship with God. Christian growth is assumed and it involves a steady diet of reading and applying God's word to our lives. Christ followers have to get rid of the stuff that are hurting our relationships with other people if we're going to be the people God intends for us to be. Let's pray. Lord, help us. Lord, we've all got emotional stuff that we hang on to. We've all got things we need to get rid of. So help us this week to throw them away, to get them out of our lives, to be the people you want us to be. And thank you, God, for being so, so good to us. Help us to live accordingly this week. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Let's stand.